not a journey with a terminus okay it's done it's over it's a it's it's a destination but within that destination it's a direction in which we keep going so yes we want to go from this cloud to that cloud so there is definitely a di uh, direction a trajectory in which we are going but when we get there we discover this cloud is infinite hmm? or to use another metaphor which we could use is say somebody is in a desert and they are struggling to get some water and they get a few drops over here or a few drops over there and that gives them a lot of sucker oh, it gives them it's like nectar it saves their life enlivens them but they are looking for an ocean mm -hmm. and they keep moving keep moving keep moving and they get to the ocean so now they dive into the ocean to swim and delight normal ocean water we can't drink but this is a special ocean now they have reached the destination they got to the water but the ocean itself is huge and they can keep diving within the ocean and they can swim they can go deep and they can keep discovering the the nectarian ocean more and more so in that sense there is both a destination and there is a eternal progression okay thank you good question any other questions yes please okay oh uh, what personal experience can give a sense of this destination and this uh, progression okay so two things the for me among the many things that attracted to me attracted me to bhakti the bhakti path the bhagavad gita itself was primary and the bhagavad gita i recited it i memorized it i keep reciting it regularly so in a sense now i know the bhagavad gita okay i know what is there in the 11th chapter what is in the 7th chapter what is in the 5th chapter i know most of the verses every time i claim that i have memorized all the verses of the gita in the next class i forget a verse <laughs> so <laughs> i won't make that claim but overall i do know the gita i visiting the gita. layers of meaning thought about this oh so that's i'm going direction is that what you are asking I was something else. No, I, I have I have I have personal experience. As what if you you know if you um let's say in the you love Christian but then he reminds you of your aunt and he, oh? and he reminds you of somebody who you don't like. Uh kind of a mother. I mean if you see if you think Christians are everywhere and you see everyone Then you told somebody who you know, I just strikes you wrong. How do you how do you okay. make myself clear? How you look Krishna is something that you see Krishna is someone that the person that you okay, I'm but sometimes uh, some people they may be disagreeable or they they may agitate our minds and then we can't we can't remember krishna we find them but them distracts us from seeing krishna is that the question yes i think agitating is good agitating is agitating is right okay really agitates yeah so okay yeah yeah if they agitate us see broadly there is equality of vision which the bhagavad gita talks about that we should see everyone spiritually but equality of vision does not mean equality of action 
is suppose there is a there is a cat somewhere nearby, and the cat is maybe going towards some milk and about to sneak in and drink, and we don't want the cat to drink the milk. We clap loudly, and the cat the cat runs away. Hmm? Now instead of that cat, there is a big cat. There is a tiger over there, and we clap. We will go away. <laughs> <laughs> So now, I might see both the cat and the tiger as souls, as spiritual beings, but still I cannot act in the same way, because the way they are going to uh, they act toward me is different. So there can be equality of vision, but there has to be individuality in action. In vision we see everyone equally, but in action we treat everyone individually, and some people they may they may lead us by the hand toward krishna we see krishna in them and they channel us they connect <coughs> us toward krishna so we some people some people take us toward krishna by the hand some people may kick us toward krishna they may repel us from them and that's how it is so because each one of us is an individual and some individuals can get along with each other. If some individuals cannot get along with each other, then we need to keep a distance. Now, some people, they, they intentionally try to agitate us. Now, scientists say that there are about <coughs> 10 billion nerve cells in our brain. And everybody has at least one or two people in their lives who seem to have done a PhD in agitating all those 10 billion nerve cells. <laughs> so now if that is happening then we need to keep a safe distance of course we can try to resolve the conflicts and get to a better understanding but sometimes things don't work that means some relationships may work best at some dis at different distances so sometimes we just keep a respectful distance and if we see krishna in that person also we can see but all that we can do is we can pray for that person or from a distance, we don't have to interact with them. We, uh, we see the Krishna connection in everyone so that we can stay connected with Krishna. But in seeing the Krishna connection with someone, in someone, if we get disconnected from Krishna, then that is not healthy. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, please. I'll come to you. Yeah. yeah. So, how do we deal with the doubt that is the Gita the destination, uh, is say what is revealed in a particular tradition, the path or what about other paths, are they like other clouds which are also attracting us? Not exactly that they are competing clouds, it is you know, different metaphors serve different purposes. So, for understanding multiple faiths. A very useful metaphor is the metaphor of mountain climbing. The top of the mountain is spiritual consciousness, characterized by love for the divine. The bottom of the mountain is material consciousness. And uh, there can be multiple paths up the mountain. The paths can be many, the purpose is one. The purpose is to rise to spiritual consciousness. The paths are multiple. <clears throat> now, for mountain climbing, different people based on their background, their interests, their strengths, they might find, oh, this path is better for me. Somebody will say, this path is better. This path is very slippery, but I have a steady foot. Oh, but this path has steps. Maybe I can go up by this path, whatever. So. There are people with different dispositions and there are some religions which are you could say ex 
exclusivist. So within this mountain climbing metaphor, the exclusivist religions are those who say that our way is the only way. Only this path goes up the mountain. Mm -hmm. And if you are not following this path, you are going to go to hell. And some extremist versions of these exclusivist religions, they say not only are you going to go to hell, we will help you get there faster. <laughs> so that is like they are going, this is the only way up the mountain. Now that is exclusivism. The other idea could be pluralism. Pluralism is there are many paths. Now, this sounds good. However, sometimes pluralism can degenerate very easily to relativism. What, what is the difference between pluralism and relativism? Pluralism is the idea that okay, different people can have different paths. That's fine. But there has to be a common purpose. If you want to climb up a mountain, you can have different paths. But it's not that all paths will lead to the top of the mountain. Some paths might take you deep into a valley on the opposite side of the mountain also. Some path can take you completely away from the mountain. So pluralism, sometimes if it is uncritically embraced, it can lead to total relativism. He says, whatever path anyone wants to follow, you follow that path. Of course, everybody has the free will to choose their path. But we also need to have some objective parameters to understand what is the result of following a path. If somebody says, I want to be spiritual and the, my way of being spiritual is, I will drink lots of alcohol every day and that takes me to a different state. Well, it does take you to a different state, but that's not a spiritual state. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making is that there is exclusivism, there is pluralism and you could say there is inclusivism. Inclusivism is, there is rather than talking about one path, there is one purpose which includes many paths. And broadly speaking, if you consider the various uh, faith traditions of the world, they all talk about raising one's consciousness. And they all give resources and reasons for people to raise their consciousness. So now, we have to consider each path, whether it is taking us all the way up the mountain, and what is the, what is the ease or what is the difficulty, been going along that path. So it's not that these are all different clouds which are pulling us. Because there is there is one purpose, but there can be different paths, and uh, that's how we can ha we can respect diversity because there can be different paths up the mountain. But at the same time, we can also respect spirituality itself. Because if it, uh, diversity doesn't mean you take any path which is anti-spiritual. And that won't make you spiritual. So there is a common purpose, but there can be multiple paths. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this one. You had a question? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Maybe uh, please if you could um, help me to understand. Uh, when you say um, merging, I'm not sure I'm using the right word, but merging with Krishna and then also further exploring. My understanding is that in, um, the realization, God realization, self realization, we lose ourselves. Ev everything is of our identity, is given to God. So in that, there is. Uh, no octane anymore, me, there's no me anymore. And so how then is there exploration within that? Because if we are merged, then, then how, then, and the divine is all knowing of everything mm. and has experienced everything, then how is there exploration? Yes, it's a good question. So if we merge with the divine, then there is no, then we have offered ourselves entirely and how can there be any further exploration because the divine is omniscient. Yeah, there are words in different contexts which have different meanings. Mm. 
with respect to the absorption in God or union with God or sometimes the word merging might be used. Now we have to look at the context to see what it means. See broadly, right now, if you are, if say, you are perceiving me, I am perceiving you. There are three things over there. There is say, you are the subject of consciousness and I am the object of consciousness. And in between us is the stream of consciousness. So now, for any conscious experience to be there, mm, these three have to be there. The subject, the object and the stream. Mm. Now, now, impure consciousness is where this stream of consciousness goes to any object other than God. Rute artham yat pratiyeta na pratiyet chatmani am vidyad atmano maya yatha bhaso yatha tamaha. That when anyone sees anything meaningful, anything attractive, anything captivating but disconnected from God, that is maya. So to see things in disconnection from God is illusion. So, in the state of absorption, of oneness, whatever word we want to use, basically what happens is the, the pure consciousness goes toward God and nowhere apart from God. That does not mean we do not see other people, but we see everyone connected with God, we are absorbed in God. So, this absorption is figuratively speaking, we lose ourselves because we are not conscious of anything else, that is absorption. But even for absorption to be there, there has to be someone to be absorbed. For liberation to be there, there has to be someone to be liberated. So some, some, school, some schools of thought conceive that pure consciousness means that there is no object and there is no subject. There is only the stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The Bhagavad Gita, when it talks about pure consciousness, say for example 6.30, which you uh, probably discussed a few sessions ago. There, what does Krishna say? It, uh, it's talking about increasing levels of consciousness, higher and higher. So, yomam pashyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pashyati tasyaham na pranashyami sachame na pranashyati So, says one who sees me everywhere, uh, one who sees me in everything and everything in me. That person is never lost to me, nor am I lost to them. Okay, just a minute, I will come to that. So, let me just complete this thread of thought that, uh, that when he is, so he is saying one who sees me ev in everything and everything in me. That means there is I, there is God and there is vision. So, in the state of spiritual uh, perfection, the Bhagavad Gita, what it describes is that there is, there is Yes, as you rightly said, there is a complete giving of oneself to God, losing of oneself in God. But that losing is in terms of our consciousness completely going in. We also use this in our day-to-day -day sense. Oh, I was lost in thought. Somebody called me and we didn't listen to it. So we were lost. We are still physically there, but we are not there in terms of consciousness. So in the pure state, the, the pure consciousness is where there is a observer, there is a subject, there is the object, but the stream does not go to anywhere except the divine object. And that is the uh, personal understanding of liberation. Now, there are other schools of thought which also talk about the impersonal understanding and the Bhagavad Gita also acknowledges that there is also a state. However, this state, the Bhagavad Gita says, Brahmano hi pratishtaham. See, the absolute truth is reciprocal. If somebody wants that oneness, they can get that. Mm. But whether that will bring satisfaction, of course, it, is, it means some ways is better than the material world with its distresses. But we all long for love. And if there is no one to love and no one to be loved, then love becomes more of a mere idea than an experienced reality. So the personal understanding is that the subject and object are both there, and pure consciousness is. That the, that the stream of consciousness does not go anywhere except the divine object. So, in that sense, we lose ourselves in the divine. Okay. So, there is dualism. There is dualism. 
I would not use the word is that dualism, uh, yes and no, because the word dualism normally how it is used is that we see some reality disconnected from God. So, that dualism is illusion, that uh, but in this case the say both the personalist and impersonalist traditions both accept that there is oneness, but it is the question is only what is the nature of that oneness. The nature of that oneness is what is the matter of discussion and from one perspective that means Let us consider if somebody is eating some delicious food say like a gulab jam. So, say now this program is going or getting to get over and they have brought food outside and then at that time the fragrance of the gulab jamun comes in. So, now we have experienced the gulab jamun at this stage, but it is only through the nose. Then we go out and we see these delicious spherical balls. Oh, that looks attractive. We experience through the eyes. And then we get it in our plate and we eat it. That is when we experience it fully. So, basically, in general, on the spiritual path, oneness is the first, first level of realization. Why? because the duality in this world causes illusion. I see this person is attractive, this person is not attractive. I see this is wealthy, this is this wealth, this is poverty. I see this is, this is heat, this is cold. So, the duality distracts us from reality and that is why the first step on the spiritual path is to see beyond duality. So, the, so the, the sea side of oneness where one does not see any differentiation, just oneness. That is like the first experience of the Gulab Jamun. It is like the fragrance that comes into our nose. But as we come closer, we understand that okay, yeah, there is there is an unchanging eternal reality beyond this world. But that unchanging eternal reality also has personality. And then as we come, that is like, oh, we see the sight of the Gulab Jamun. And then you come closer and you say, oh, not only that, that unchanging reality have personality, I also have personality. So, the oneness in this case is seen in, in our nature, our purpose. It is like say, if some, some country attacks, say if Iran attacks America, then all of America will become united in defending. So, there is a unity of purpose, there is a unity of nature, but with, so there is, we often talk about this hierarchy that there is diversity and there is unity. We want unity in diversity, that is true, but what the Bhagavad Gita says is yes, we have from diversity to unity, so that we have unity in diversity, but then we also have diversity in unity, which is at a spiritual level and that is why in the 15th chapter there is a verse which talks about how Urdhva Moola Madha Shakam is an upside down banyan tree. That this world is like a reflection. Now, unless there is a reality, there cannot be a reflection. So, the du so the what we call as duality in the world, that, that duality would not be present in the reflection unless it is present in the reality. So, but that duality is within the spectrum of oneness because we are absorbed only in God and whatever else we see, we see it all in connection with God. But in this world, the duality is such that it disconnects us from God. So, basically, if you go back again to the fundamental definition of illusion, some of us may think duality is illusion, which is true at one level, but at a fundamental level, the fundamental illusion is not duality, the fundamental illusion is disconnection from God. If there is connection with God, then even when there is duality, that duality also intensifies the joy. This yesterday was Radha Ashtami and Radha Krishna have their sweet pastimes and sometimes they are united and sometimes they are separated. So, when they are separated, that intensifies their longing, when will we meet? And when they are united, they are so delighted when they are united, again they are separated. 
but in separation or in union both cases there is absorption in the divine and thus the root cause of illusion which needs to be overcome is not simply duality but it is disconnection from god okay. uh, can you repeat your question Okay, good question. So, if we see Krishna everywhere, then can Krishna speak through anyone? He can speak through others also? Yes, he can. See, the key thing is uh, not where something is coming from, but where something is taking us. That means that even within us, sometimes the voices say, come on, do this, don't do this. Now, how do we know whether it is God speaking within us or our own illusion speaking within us, our own mind speaking within us? It's very difficult uh, to discern things based on their origin because it's very difficult. How do we identify that? But if we, we, if we study the books like the Bhagavad Gita, they give us an overall compass for life. And once we have a compass, then whenever any input comes from anywhere, we see whether this input is taking me in the direction of the spiritual compass or it is taking me away. Yeah, so if somebody says something which upsets us, we lose our peace, yes, we all want peace. But more than peace, we want purpose. We want purpose. We want to do something meaningful. If you consider that somebody tells you for the, you know, I'll give you a private room and there'll be no disturbance. Somebody will provide you food, somebody will provide you water and just be peaceful for the rest of your life. Okay, we want peace, but I want to do something. It's like, we want peace, but more than peace, we want purpose. It's, so, peace is basically, uh, if somebody is very sick and they are in pain, then at that time, any moment they do, they cause pain. Ah, ah, and then they think that, if I could just stop moving, I will be free from pain. And yes, they will be free from pain if they stop moving. But as soon as they become free from pain, they will want to do something. So, the cause of their pain seems to be motion, but the cause of the pain is not motion, it is disease. <coughs> the disease is cured, then automatically they can move in a healthy way. So, similarly, we definitely want peace, but more important, but peace is like, I don't want anything which will cause me pain. But okay, after you get peace, what after that? We want something more than that. We want purpose in our life, we want meaning in our life. And when we want purpose, that purpose often comes with challenges. So yes, if somebody is agitating us very much, we can keep a distance from them. But more than keeping a distance from someone, you know, we need to see where I want to go. What is my purpose in life? So if you want to connect with Krishna, then what are the positive activities that I can do with, for connecting with Krishna? To put something behind us, we have to put something ahead of us. So, we cannot simply push someone away from us. In, in, to, we, our brain is such a thing that we cannot, our thoughts, we can't empty them. We can't, we can't drive away any thought from within us. But we can crowd a certain thought out of us. So, the more you put something positive in your consciousness and pursue it purposefully, then the disturbing people and the agitation they are causing, that will subside. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, let us move on. Actually, we have to begin the answers. Bro, till what time is the class? 8.30 and if you wish to have some more question answer. Okay. 8.30. So, now I said in the 40th verse, Arjuna, 
assures Krishna assures Arjuna that yes, there is that, that there is that you'll never have any loss. Then at one level, people need to be assured. Like if somebody is very sick, doctor, what has happened to me? Have I got cancer? Have I got some disease? Things are all right. Things will be all right. But the doctor can't just give some simple assurance. The doctor has to tell, why are you having this pain? What do you have to do about it? So then Krishna also rationally analyzes. So Arjuna's question is here that somebody takes on the spiritual journey, but they are unable to complete it. And then they die just without that journey completed. Then what will happen to them? And Krishna says, the spiritual credits you have will never be lost. That's the, that means this attraction to the spiritual, to the transcendental will always be there. And broadly speaking, uh, if you consider the cloud metaphor once again, from this cloud to the, the, uh, uh, this cloud to this cloud, a small cloud is moving. Now, it may not reach the destination for two reasons. One is that some strong wind comes uh, and it sweeps it uh, somewhere away. The other could be that it just runs out of time. See, we all have a finite time in this lifetime and we are, we all want to grow spiritually, but sometimes the, the distance that we need to cover in our spiritual journey, the time required for it, we may run out of time. So, Krishna considers both these possibilities. The first possibility is that a wind sweeps somebody away. That means that Although they had a strong spiritual desire, which made them start the journey, but that desire became overpowered by some other desire. The world keeps alluring us with so many pleasures and we might resist them for some time, but after some time we might again get allured. So if that happens, Krishna says, this first possibility, that is the wind sweeps you away. So he describes that. So, the 40th verse was the general answer. The 41st verse he says that Prapya punya katan lokan ushitva shashvate sama shuchinam shrimatam gehe yogo brashto bhijayate. He says the Bhagavad Gita envisions the universe to be broadly three level. We live at the earthly level. Below, uh, we could call it the terrestrial. Hmm? And above this is the celestial level, it is the heavenly level. So, what is heaven? Basically, if you consider the ordinary parlance also, oh, that was heavenly. Some food was heavenly, that place was heavenly. The idea is that something which gives us immense pleasure, we call it heaven. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita's uh, description of the universe, heaven and the kingdom of God, they are two separate things. The spiritual world, heaven exists within the material world where there are better material pleasures. So, Srila Prabhupada said that in some ways, Hawaii is like heaven. In some ways, not always, but I say that is a place where there is lot of beauty, lot of uh, maybe naturally comfortable and lot of pleasure available. So, Krishna says that if somebody has strong desires, the wind comes and sweeps it away means somebody has strong desire for worldly pleasure. Then he says that person will go to a heavenly place where they can have that desire fulfilled. And after fulfilling that desire abundantly, then they will come back to the earthly level. And at the earthly level, they will be born either in a Brahminical, in a cultured, spiritually cultured family or in a wealthy family. So, the idea is that after the desire has been fulfilled, then when they come back to this world, they won't have to struggle for again beginning their spiritual journey. See, we may have to struggle in our spiritual journey in two ways. One is that our material life itself is so problematic. Some people, they may have to work 15, 17, 18. Uh, 10, uh, 12, 15, 17 hours just for earning a living, then they have no time for spiritual life. If somebody is reasonably well to do, then they can pursue other things. Of course, they can pursue more illusion also. But here we are talking about people who already had a spiritual inclination. They had a spiritual inclination, they got deviated, 
but those desires they were able to fulfill abundantly now they come back that itch is over now then if there are no material distractions or they don't have too much struggle for maintaining themselves they can march forward or if they are born in a spiritually cultured family then again they get uh, the spiritual inclination gets nourished so this is how krishna says that whatever spiritual advancement you have done that is not lost you get swept away but you will come back again on the path so you get swept away you go there you come back and move on the other case as i said is somebody is moving but they don't get swept away but just that they run out of time then he says that athava yogina meva kule bhavati dhimatam etad didurlavataram loke janmaya didrusham says the other other category of people they are born in not just a spiritually cultured family but a spiritually advanced family where the parents are not just spiritually favorable but the parents are already spiritually very serious then what happens the children get they have their spiritual inclinations right from their previous life but they also get it, it in their upbringing and then they can move forward much faster so both ways the spiritual opportunity even if it's it seems to be it seems to be lost in this life it will eventually come back and then krishna describes what happens after that okay it said somebody might be very spiritually advanced hmm? but uh, now when they are born from the mother's womb they are not going to cry god's names they are not going to say hari they are going to cry so to some extent uh, our spiritual our spirituality is expressed through our biology our spirituality is expressed through our biology that means when a baby is very small the baby will bio act according to his biological drives hmm? but our, our identity is not limited to our biology so what will happen is krishna says <coughs> purva abhyasena te naiva riyate yavashopi saha jigyasura api yogasya shabda brahmati vartate purva abhyas by the spiritual practice which they have done in the past riyate yavashopi saha they will be helplessly attracted nobody needs to tell them about spirituality they will just get automatically attracted i <clears throat> i was in uk just now so i met a a devotee a girl a teenager not a teenager maybe 20 25 she from she is from poland and in poland we have one of our leaders is one sindra devna maharaj who does big festivals so she said when she was sick six they were just going out for she was a, with her parents she was going out for a uh they were just going out for a walk and suddenly she felt i want to go there she says, what's there no i want to go there the mother thought it's just the child has curiosity let's go and there there is a big festival of india tent now it is like a lot of colorful activities are happening over there but this small girl she just took her mother straight straight now there are there are places where there are gopi dots so, so girls are do- decorated with various dots they wear different kinds of dresses all kind of fun things are there but she didn't go anywhere she just went straight to the place where there was a temple and she went there and she was born in a christian family but she went there and started folding her hands she says what are you doing his mother couldn't understand so i guess she was so captivated by that she didn't she couldn't consciously articulate what was it see all of us we could say we have certain articulated knowledge we have certain embodied knowledge and then beyond that there is things which we don't know so that means most of us if we have grown up in uh, learning a particular mother tongue a particular language as our mother tongue then we can speak reasonably well according to the grammatical rules of that language but if somebody asks us what are the grammatical rules uh, if somebody speaks something wrong it's not spoken like this it's spoken like this but what's wrong with that no no it's not it's not right but why is not right we might not be able to articulate it 
So, what happens is our articulated knowledge is less, our embodied knowledge is more. We know many more things than what we can put in words and many times you might notice that uh, that we hear something, we are thinking, of, we are discussing on some issue and somebody speaks something, that was the word I was looking for, that was the thought I was looking for. Emerson said that, Ralph Aldo Emerson, he said, all my best thoughts have been stolen by the ancestors. <laughs> all my best thoughts have been stolen by the ancestors. That means what? That so it's 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 I'm all I'm already doing it, but hey, that's what I was thinking. So we have articulated knowledge, and beyond that, a bigger circle is embodied knowledge, and beyond that is what we don't know. So what Krishna is saying over there is that when a child is born new, and a child is in coming into this journey, they may not have any articulated knowledge of what they are doing. But riyate ya avashopi saha, they will be helplessly attracted towards spirituality. Helplessly here in the sense of irresistibly. And then once that, once that attraction is there, the connection is established. Tatratam buddhisam yogam labate paurva dehikam yata tejatato bhuya samsiddhav kurunandana. Then once that first connection is established, then again the practice resumes. That means this, this cloud was moving this way, it, it could not reach the full destination. So, when that soul is born again, somehow that by that irresistible attraction, the connection is established and the journey resumes, the journey resumes. And then after that, prayatna yatamanastu yogi samshuddha kilvishaha Aneka janma samsiddhas tatoyati paramgatim. And Krishna says, don't lose heart even if this takes multiple lifetimes. So sometimes it's it's not necessary that it. Uh, enlightenment, you know, the speed, the, it's, not, it's not necessarily slow, it's not necessarily slow, it's not necessarily fast. Now, we will progress at the pace that works the best for us. So, you know, uh, one way I talk about the mood of the Gita is that at when Krishna says mama vartamanu vartante manushyaha partha sarvasha that all people are on my path. What it means is that from your place at your pace access the grace. So, from your place wherever you are like I am talking about the mountain some people might be already half the way up the mountain, some people might be at the bottom of the mountain, some people might be in a valley at the bottom of the mountain. But from your place, you start off, the grace is available, the path to rise up is there. And at your pace, some people might move very fast, some people might move slowly. So, of course, what you are saying is true is that we should not expect or demand that the growth will be very fast. Good question. So, if we are, uh, yeah, I understand what you are saying. If we are on a multi life spiritual journey, and along this journey, we might be growing spiritually, but we are also acting in the world, so will not we be accumulating karma by that? Yes, acting in the world does mean that there will be some amount of karma. However, because there will be a spiritual inclination. And if we are progressing on the spiritual journey, that spiritual inclination will keep getting stronger and stronger. And because of that, the negative negative actions that we will do will be far lesser. The negative karma that we will accumulate will also be lesser. And even the positive karma that we do, so the negative karma, there is positive karma and beyond that there is spiritual karma. So, even the positive karma, we will, we will spiritualize it more and more. So, on the spiritual journey, our focus, we need to be 
Krishna conscious, not karma conscious. You know, we shouldn't worry so much. Oh, I have to, I have to get rid of this karma. I have to avoid that karma. We can actually, if we become too karma conscious, we can almost become paranoid. Oh, this will cause me some karma. This will cause me some karma. We have to act like human beings, functioning in a compassionate mode. So, yes, we will, we will accumulate some karma, but that karma will get neutralized as we move forward spiritually. So, the important thing is keep moving forward spiritually. See, uh, beyond the mechanics of the principle of karma, we have to see the purpose of Krishna. Krishna's purpose is not retribution, it is redemption. Retribution is you did this and you have to suffer this. That is not Krishna's purpose, it is redemption, he wants to elevate us, he wants to uh, is it redirect us towards him. So. If we intensely want to move toward him, he will adjust the karma in such a way we can keep moving forward toward him. Okay. You had a question? Actually, kind of answer. Like but I have like some sure. answer to the question. Okay. So Krishna is in a complete this point. So Krishna says, over multiple lifetimes you will go on the spiritual journey and ultimately you will attain perfection. So, the overall mood of Krishna's discussion here is that do not worry too much about what will happen in the future. I am taking a spiritual journey right now, do not worry too much if this will go wrong, that will go wrong, that will go wrong. Krishna says you, you do your part right now and the remaining I will take care of that. So, that is the essential mood over here, the specifics can vary. We can worry too much about the future. Oh, what of this? What of this? What of this? What of that? We can't know what the future holds, but we can know who holds the future. We can know who holds the future. That is Krishna, and we can hold on to the one who holds the future. So, if we hold on to Krishna then whatever the future will bring, Krishna will guide us through it. That is the overall reassuring message of this section. I will summarize, I spoke today on this section of the future destination of a incomplete yogi, of a yogi is not completed as the path. So, Arjuna first has a question about what if the mind just is too restless, so says persevere. This is what if somebody cannot persevere? The two clouds metaphor was there that if somebody leaves the cl cloud of material piety and goes to the cloud of spirituality but gets swept away, will they be neither here nor there? And then he asks Krishna, I have this doubt, but I, I trust that you can answer this question. So, I talked about how at one level doubt and knowledge are opposites, but another level doubt and knowledge are successive destinations on the same journey. So, we have doubts only when we have at least a desire to know and are unable to know. So, uh, in a dri while driving, doubting is like the brakes and putting faith is like pressing the accelerator. So, when something does not make sense, there is a doubt. But somebody always has doubts and never puts faith and that is like a person using the brakes alone to move. So, doubt is a sign of intelligence, but doubt is not the only sign of intelligence. And then when Krishna answers Arjuna's question in text 40, the first focus is that given assurance. Now, whenever a question is there, there is the rational part and there is the emotional part. And the answerer of the question needs to carefully see what is prominent. If it is the emotional part that is prominent, then that needs to be addressed first the rational part is one that needs to be addressed first. So, Krishna here notices that Arjuna has this apprehension. So, first he gives the assurance, one who is in the spiritual path will never lose either in this or the next life. And how that never loss will happen that he describes, first if the person, if the cloud gets swept away by gust of wind, that means some other desires take over the person, then in the heavens the facility for fulfilling that desire will be given and then the person can come back again to 
continue in our life in a in this world where there not be many distractions or if the person just runs out of time there is no no other desire then they will be born in a spiritual family where they can just march ahead straight and complete that journey and what is complete how, how how does one's previous spirituality manifest in this life our spirituality doesn't contradict our biology so a baby might be born just crying like any other baby but as that baby grows within the biology the spirituality starts manifesting the six year old girl suddenly wants to go to a place and sees beautiful deities and gets absorbed over there so i talk there about three levels with respect to cognition there is articulated knowledge and there is embodied knowledge and then there is lack of knowledge so our past spirituality will not be within our articulated knowledge but it will be within our embodied knowledge like a person who knows how to speak in a language and what is right and what is wrong but doesn't know the specific rules so a person who has practiced spirituality they'll automatically be attracted towards spirituality although they might not be able to make a rational case of why am i attracted to this why is this good but they can learn that and they resume that journey and gradually over multiple lifetimes the same principle of attraction will continue and ultimately they will attain the destination so krishna's mood overall is that while you are practicing spirituality now don't worry about the future you take care of the present and i will take care of the future for you thank you very much hare krishna